Welcome to Planning, Management, and Leadership for Health IT, Purchasing and Contracting. This is Lecture C, Negotiating and Contracting. The objectives for this lecture, Negotiating and Contracting, are to understand the process for gathering a team to negotiate a contract, understand the need for documenting contract goals and objectives, and understand the purpose of a contract and how to participate in a negotiation. As you proceed down the evaluation path and you move closer and closer to selection, you find yourself in the negotiation process. The first function of the negotiation is to determine who is on your negotiation team. You should always have at least some representatives from the evaluation team on the negotiation team, whether that is an IT director who is running the negotiation, a user owner, for instance, in a lab system negotiation, the director of the lab should be included. You may also want to have someone from finance on the team. Generally speaking, the CEO or managing partner at a physician practice is not included in the negotiation phase of a contract. They definitely need to be informed of the progress of the issues that are being negotiated. However, most of the time they are not involved in the details of the negotiation, simply because they do not have the time. One of the key rules for the negotiation team is that one-on-one -on -one meetings are not allowed unless there is prior discussion by the team and they occur as part of the negotiation strategy. You want to make sure you have, as a team, one voice coming out of the negotiation, that you are all on the same page and that the vendor does not have the ability to gain an advantage by talking to one person over someone else. Many times as you deal with vendors and have a relationship with them, especially if you are a current customer, you can become friendly. That is very, very common in the business world today. However, when it comes to negotiating a contract and dealing with large dollars, software packages and hardware that could affect the financial livelihood and financial viability of your organization, you have to remember that the vendor, while perfectly nice, is not your friend. Vendors have a goal that they are trying to meet, and you have a goal that you are trying to meet. All discussions during the negotiation and leading up to the negotiation regarding the project should be kept at a business level and should be documented. One key phrase that is good to remember when getting ready to negotiate a contract is, all the vendors are in last place as far as they know. At some point in the negotiation process, you can be assured that your vendor will ask, how are we doing? Who is in first place? Are we winning? As soon as they feel that they have the advantage and that they have won a deal, you have lost leverage. So you can smile and tell the vendor who is asking you that they are in last place. Do not let them know where they stand. Remember, whether they are in fourth or first place, they are always in last place until a contract is signed. Have a written game plan before the negotiation begins. As you go through the evaluation stage of the project, you should be defining the things that you have to have. The reason you're purchasing this software product is to do several key functions. Document those. Know what you have to have. Also know what you would like to have. Keep a running file of both. These are the things that we have to have, and these are the things we would like to have. Know what you could live without, and then know what your budget is or what you can afford. As you go through the negotiation, you may have to reduce functionality or reduce hardware based on your budget. That is the time to look back at your list of things that you have to have, the things that you would like to have, and the things you can live without. If you do not have that written down, if you do not have that documented, it is very likely that you could lose that functionality in the middle of a negotiation and not really be aware of it. When reading through contracts, remember that just because it is in writing does not mean that it is not negotiable before the contract is signed. 
Many times people will take the attitude that contracts are legal documents and they cannot be changed. That is a false assumption. Contracts can be changed right up to the point of signature. Many vendors put in clauses to protect themselves, known as hold harmless clauses. Sometimes these clauses are too broad and put you in a position of not having legal recourse for potentially dangerous software errors. Have your legal counsel review these clauses very carefully and do not accept at face value any term in a contract that you disagree with. Be prepared to walk away. The purchase of software and hardware will result many times in a decade-long relationship with a vendor. Before getting into a situation that is going to be a pain point for the organization for the next 10 years, it is better to walk away. The dual or single-threaded negotiation strategy is a strategy that is determined by each organization based on their resources and requirements. Do you negotiate with two vendors at the same time, or do you negotiate with one while keeping the other vendor in the race should the negotiation fall through with the first? The advantage of a dual negotiation strategy is that should negotiations break down with one vendor, you save time because you have already been working through a negotiation with the second. So, at that point with the negotiation breaking down, you could shift all your focus to the second vendor and keep going, and that is an advantage. On the other hand, negotiating with two suppliers at the same time is time-consuming and stressful. Many organizations do not have the resources to run two simultaneous negotiations, and they choose to go with a single-threaded model. The benefit of the single-threaded model is that you have the time to focus on one vendor and what their contract points are. It is less confusing when thinking back. Now, which vendor did we have that conversation with? The downside, as was alluded to before, is that after potentially weeks of negotiation with a vendor, if they break down and you do walk away, you have to go back to the second vendor and start up. You may have lost four or five weeks of time. If time is not as critical, then it is not as big a harm. But if you are facing a hard deadline due to a system decommissioning or a change of a regulatory requirement, you may not have the luxury to begin negotiations fresh with another vendor. Be realistic in expectations, but shoot for the moon anyway. The main thing is to be realistic. You are not there to drive the vendor out of business. You are not there to get the best deal at the expense of the vendor's ability to provide support services. You would like to get the best deal possible, definitely, for your organization. So, shoot for the moon where you can. But at some point, it may be advisable to give on certain issues or certain items that you can live without in order to maintain a good relationship with your vendor. Dictionary.com defines a contract as the agreement between two or more parties for the doing or not doing of something and as an agreement enforceable by law. Legal documents should not be entered into lightly or with a failure to fully comprehend the implications of the terms and conditions contained within them, since these will govern a business relationship over a defined period of time. As the definition states, a contract should be an agreement between parties, not the acceptance of one party's views and offerings at the expense of the other. The functional owners of a product must be involved in the negotiation process and reach the point of agreement before a contract should be signed. They cannot just pass off the negotiations to the IT department. Most vendor organizations, if not all, have a boilerplate contract. This is their standard contract without any customization for the unique needs of the particular client. At the time when you begin negotiations, they will be more than happy to provide you with their boilerplate contract. Generally speaking, in a boilerplate contract, all the terms and conditions are written to the favor of the vendor and must be negotiated by the customer, 
to either the customer's favor or at least a neutral position. We mentioned this earlier in regard to hold harmless clauses. In light of this situation, some organizations will not accept a vendor boilerplate contract and instead will develop their own contract and use that as a starting point for negotiations. Take time to read every contract, or at least have someone you trust in your organization read a contract for you, provide you with a summary of the key points, and make sure that the issues are being tracked. If there is legal counsel available to you, have them review all contracts. Contracts are not all about legalese. Many people have the perception that contracts are truly all about those arcane legal terms and language that nobody can understand if they are not an attorney, such as limits of liability or force majeure. Force majeure, by the way, is a French word meaning superior force, and Dictionary.com defines it as an unexpected and disruptive event that may operate to excuse a party from a contract. There is some legalese in every contract, and that is what the lawyers are there to review. However, there is a whole lot of other stuff in there lawyers don't care anything about, and that is primarily the business issues. The contract should spell out on what hardware the vendor will certify its software will work, what support options and times are being purchased, and importantly tell you how to get out of a contract should the need arise. It will tell you things that you, as the owner of that software, have a vested interest in. You have to make sure everything is covered and that it is in your favor. Someone who is adept at running numbers and who really understands the financials of the organization should be involved at some point in the negotiation. There are times when finance officially will not be a member of the negotiation team. However, much like a CEO or managing partner at a physician practice, the appropriate financial officer should be informed of the negotiation, of the budget, a picture of where you feel you're going to be falling in the budget range, and what the progress has been. They should approve any contract before it is signed. They also will be useful when tracking the project budget through the implementation phase, so it is to your advantage to get them involved on the front end of the contract, to understand what is in the contract and how it was structured in the beginning, so that they can track the finances throughout the implementation. Another important concept is that a contract is what everyone falls back on when things go wrong, and at some point, they will. As you review a contract and as you proceed through the negotiation, you should always keep an eye on the termination and the out clauses. There come times, as stated before, that things will not work out as you thought that they would, and things will go bad. Make sure that you have placed the due diligence in the review so that you can get out of the contract if necessary. Remember, if it is not in writing, it does not count. Many times when you talk with vendors about scenarios or about what happens if, you will get responses of, oh, that never happens, or, well, if that does happen, we'll take care of it. In reality, people change and memories fade. So when arguments or disputes arise, everyone goes back to the contract and looks to see what it says specifically about the item. If it does not address what you wanted it to, or what you think it should, then the contract is the deciding point, and you may be out of luck. From time to time, some organizations will ask themselves whether or not they should outsource the contract negotiation to a third party. The answer to this question hinges on several factors. First, do you have the time and expertise to negotiate this in-house? Second, does the risk of the contract warrant the engagement of an external specialty firm? And finally, what type of relationship do you have with the vendor today? And what do you see it being like after the negotiation? The first two are fairly self-explanatory. 
but the third point may need a word or two of explanation. Large acquisitions where the dollars and the stress levels are high can create a volatile situation once negotiations have begun. Remember that once the deal is signed, the customer will have to live with that vendor for a very long time. Many times, third parties are brought in for their expertise, but also because they can play the role of the bad cop, while the customer can play the good cop, thereby preserving a good working relationship with the vendor. This strategy may allow you to achieve the positive benefits of playing hardball without getting your hands dirty. This concludes purchasing and contracting. In summary, the purchase of technology simply for technology's sake is the fastest way to spend large amounts of cash quickly without providing any value to the organization in return. Prior to any purchase, it is imperative that there be a compelling business case developed justifying the project from a functional as well as a financial standpoint. Be sure that whatever process you use to evaluate and select computer-related products is formal, logical, and can produce a fair and equitable selection process to all parties involved. A highly skilled craftsman must be adept at using multiple tools to accomplish a job, and the RFP, or Request for Proposal, is not the only tool in your IT toolbox. Just as you wouldn't use a hammer to saw a board in half, the RFP will not fit every need. Over the course of these presentations, you have been exposed to numerous tools and evaluation aids. As you develop your own level of proficiency in software selection, you will learn to use multiple tools as the situation dictates. Contracts are not infallible, unchangeable documents handed down from the legal gods to earth. Don't be afraid to read these documents with a critical eye. Challenge those terms and conditions you disagree with. Make sure that your best interests are covered and you can live with the final negotiated document before signing on the dotted line. If you are not confident in where the negotiations have led you, remember, you always have the option of walking away at any point up to signature. Prior to playing in a football game, the coaches will develop a game plan based on the strengths and weaknesses of their team matched against those of their opponent. Many hours will be spent in preparation for 60 minutes of playing time. How much more important is it for you and your team to prepare for a few hours or days of contract negotiations? Document what you need to gain in functionality, determine what you can afford, and develop a negotiation plan to ensure a successful conclusion to the selection process.